What is your favourite psalm and why? Seven simple words that struck absolute fear into my heart. Not, thankfully, when we were discussing this sermon series on the psalms, but when I was in training and starting my final course on the Old Testament. The first half of that course was dedicated to learning about the Psalms, and I'd been looking forward to it, not least because I knew very little about them. You see, we didn't use them much uh, as a church here in St. Mary's, and my knowledge of the Psalms was largely limited to singing them as a choir boy in services of matins in the 1980s. And so that question, definitely not rhetorical and addressed to each of us individually to answer in turn, put me into something of a tailspin. I wasn't sure that I had a favorite psalm. Of course, Psalm 23 is the best known, but I felt that would be considered a bit of a lame choice by my fellow trainees. And much more pragmatically, I knew that in a room of 30 or 40 other people, someone else in that same predicament would nap that one before me. So, of course, while others were giving their answers, I surreptitiously flicked to the Psalms in my Bible, chose one, and made up what I hoped would be a plausible reason for it being my favorite. But much more importantly, I pledged to pay attention to the next five weeks of study to learn a bit more about this ancient book of songs. But what was interesting, as we had tea and biscuits in the break during that first tutorial, was how many others had been in that same predicament. The reality is that the Psalms are much less frequently used in worship than they were. We read and we preach on them much less than we did. And this week I found myself reflecting a little on why that is. Well, for one thing, let's face it, there are some pretty miserable psalms in the Psalter. Psalms that are hard to read and certainly hard to pray, particularly at times when we might be at a low ebb ourselves. The book of Psalms is long. It's the third longest in our Bibles and therefore quite challenging, I think, for us to access. Where exactly should we start? It's also a book of poetry. Now, some of you I know will love poetry, but other, others of us, I think, will find it challenging and harder to understand. <laughs> Fourthly, each of the Psalms is written very personally by its author, and often they can feel very much like someone else's prayer. In a church and a faith that has arguably become more individual and less collective, we might find ourselves asking why we should be praying this prayer of David or Asaph or anyone else for that matter. And of course, finally, a large part of the answer is that we are simply out of practice because we don't read and learn about the Psalms much. We've lost that sense of connection with them. Which means, of course, that this summer sermon series is a good opportunity to open the Psalter afresh and to improve our knowledge of this incredible book or books, as we'll explore in a moment. And hopefully that might in turn make us more comfortable and confident in reading and studying and praying 
the Psalms in the future. And so let's start, given that this is the first talk in this series, by orientating ourselves just a little bit. When we speak of the Psalms, what exactly are we talking about? Well, scholarship of the Psalms has seen a developing pattern of interpretation. Before the 20th century, the Psalms were seen as religious poems of the devout in ancient Israel, most notably written by King David, but also by Asaph, the sons of Korah, and a variety of other authors, some of them anonymous. Then, increasingly during the 20th century, the Psalms came to be seen not as the prayers of individuals, but as being composed for singing in the temple at Jerusalem. And more recent scholarship in what's called the canonical approach has suggested that these songs of worship were then edited very intentionally into the structure that we have today, probably after the Jewish exile in the 5th century BC. This canonical approach has revealed a very intentional design of the Psalter as the prayer book that accompanies the Jewish scriptures. The anonymous Psalms 1 and 2 form a very clear introduction. They call down God's blessing on those who meditate on the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, and on those who take refuge in the King, the Messiah. This introduction is then followed by five clearly delineated books. You'll find the subheadings in your Bibles, with each book concluding with the words, may the Lord God of Israel be blessed forever. Amen and amen. And the Psalter concludes with five psalms of praise, which each begin hallelujah, or praise the Lord. And within each book of Psalms, we find an alternation between lament and praise. And as I mentioned earlier, it's these Psalms of lament that I think we can perhaps find hardest to read or to pray. But let's just remember that those Psalms of lament are very consistent in that the psalmist brings God's attention to what is wrong in the world, and asks for God's response. The Psalms teach us not to ignore the pain of the world or the pain in our lives. There are times when it is good and proper for us to lament, whether we use the psalmist's words or our own. And thankfully, there are more psalms of praise than psalms of lament, which is perhaps a useful motivation for us to read the Psalter, but also important theologically too. Because the psalms, like the rest of our scriptures, are forward-looking. They look to the promise of the messianic kingdom. The Psalter reveals Torah and Messiah, lament and praise, but most of all the triumph of faith and hope. And as an aside, it's hardly surprising that those crowds of Jesus' followers, highly literate in the Psalter as they would have been, saw him as Messiah and were so intent in installing him as the earthly king, as we heard in our gospel reading just a few moments ago. But I've digressed, which is difficult because in some ways I haven't actually started yet. Back to that question, what is your favorite psalm and why? Psalm 103 has inspired one of the greatest hymns, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven, that we sang at the very start of our worship this morning. It was written by Henry Francis Light in 1834. 
He incidentally also produced some of the greatest hits of the English hymnal, including Abide With Me, God of Mercy, God of Grace, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, Christ is made the sure foundation, and How Great Thou Art. But separately, and 179 years later, Psalm 103 inspired Matt Redman to write one of the greatest and most popular worship songs ever written, 10,000 Reasons, and you'll be pleased to know that we'll be singing that later on too. Two very different and wonderful pieces of worship music, but both inspired by the depth of feeling expressed by the psalmist for his God. And so taking that canonical approach, let's first consider Psalm 103's placement in the Psalter. It forms part of a group of four Psalms, 103 to 106, at the very end of book four of the Psalter. Psalms 104, 105, and 106 form a poetic summary of the Torah, Genesis to Deuteronomy, and a fairly damning one at that. It expresses Israel's failure to stay true to their covenant with God. And in that context, Psalm 103 forms a sort of preface that expresses this strong sense of hope and faith that however humanity messes up, God remains faithful to the last. Because this psalm is dominated by two Hebrew words, Barak and Hesed. Barak, as in Obama, but I think that's probably a different sermon, means bless. The psalmist is exhorting himself and those praying or singing this psalm to bless the Lord. Now that can feel a little bit curious, I think. So often we think and talk of ourselves being blessed by God. But in this instance, it is we who are called to bless God instead. And in this context, Barak means bless as in praise or worship or adore or give thanks. And the psalmist goes on in this attitude of gratitude to express the many reasons why he and we should bless the Lord. He reminds us of the amazing grace that God bestows upon us. Forgiveness, healing, mercy, justice, and most of all, a steadfast love that is everlasting. The Hebrew word that the psalmist uses four times in this psalm is hesed. It's a word that is so laden with meaning that translators struggle to find an English equivalent. The NRSV translates it as steadfast love. The King James as mercy. The NIV as simply love. And in other versions, it's rendered as unfailing love or faithful love. It's a favorite word of the psalmists, expressed 127 times in the Psalms out of 245 times in the whole of the Old Testament. And it occurs four times in this psalm alone. And so this psalm for me is a wonderful articulation of the character of God, whose steadfast love is as high as the sky and as wide as the distance from east to west, as the psalmist puts it. His steadfast love is like the love of a father or mother for their child. The psalmist remembers that while our earthly lives are fragile, short, and transitory, God's hesed is everlasting. It was a message of hope to a downcast nation in exile. The prophets had told them 
that the exile was their fault. It was because of the people's sinfulness. And this psalm helped to reassure them that God's steadfast love, his hesed, knows no bounds. That love will win out in the end. And it can help to reassure us too. No more perfect, no less sinful of that same truth. And finally, of course, this psalm is a message of reciprocity, of circularity in this idea of hesed. We are invited by God to enter into this cosmic circle of love, love of God, love of neighbor, love of self. We are reminded that whoever we are, Whatever our place in this wonderful kingdom, no matter what stage of life we are in, we are called to bless the Lord with our whole heart, soul, and mind. But also to bless the Lord with our words and our actions, with our own steadfast love for our neighbor and for all of creation. And so may we each go into the world. May we notice God in creation and in one another. And may we bless the Lord. Amen. Notices and bans of marriage. So I publish the bans of marriage between Joseph Miles Jackson and Emily Louisa Thompson both of this parish, um, and to be married here on the 30, 31st of August. I knew it was right at the end of August. Uh, they're getting married here. Um, this is for the first time of asking if any of you know any reason in law where they may not marry each other, you are to declare it now. And let's be praying for Joseph and Emily. Also for Hannah and Ryan who are here and their wedding's coming up very soon. Um, pray for them in their preparations and in their married life to come. Amen. So please remember for the next five weeks our service is at 10 o'clock. Um, please also leave your service sheets. Um, you can take the yellow ones with the word, song words on, but please leave your service sheets because um, we'd like them to be here for the next five weeks. Um, if you're not used to psalms, um, you can enjoy morning and evening prayer, and there are lots of psalms through that. Um, there's an app that you can use if, if you're that way inclined on your phone, um, and it Somebody actually reads morning prayer if you want to, so that's a way of joining in. You're also very welcome to join me at six o'clock tonight at Halton for Cora Leaven Song, and there'll be psalms at that as well. So lots of opportunity. Um, next Sunday is the fourth. There's going to be afternoon teas again. Um, wonderful that over 30 people came last week. And Natalie and I know Wendy and whoever else was here took £83. So thank you. That was just fantastic. Um, we're going to be doing them next week and then two weeks after each, you know, fortnightly after that. Um, if you can help or if you can bake, Natalie's there. Wave, Natalie, please um, have a word with her and that would be great. On the update with details of the Commonwealth Wargrave Tours at Holton. Uh, St. Michael's Holton. Um, there's one this coming Thursday on the 1st, and then there's one on Sunday the 11th. Um, if you go on to the update, you will see the details there. It's fascinating. If you've never been to Holton, go. There are over 100 Commonwealth War um, graves there, um, and the person taking you around will tell all sorts of stories um, about them. If you're not doing that, on the 11th, you can do the walking treasure hunt that Michael and Carol have organized. Um, and then another thing that's happening during the summer, 
Um, at the Christian Centre on a Tuesday and a Thursday, there's activities each week. On the Tuesday, there is lunch that you can order, um, and Judy's um, masterminding that, uh, helping Ellie to do that. There's a list on the board, um, just be as you leave church, um, that's got the menu, um, a, a sign-up sheet there, or you can speak to Judy. Um, so to book that meal, um, you don't have to go every week. Um, but it's, if you would like to do that, then that is happening um, each Tuesday. And I say Thursday, there's activities as well, um, but there's not lunch then. Um, there will be coffee and tea afterwards, um, so please do join us for that. <coughs> Let's go.